YouTube's a terrible time waster, isn't it? You, you want to watch one clip before you know it, you've watched three or four. And one of the clips that happens to me with is when I look up near misses, close calls, uh, <laughs> it's often videos of, of disaster or near disaster. Uh, it can involve a car crash, a truck crash, a, a plane nearly hitting another plane, motorbike crashes or near crashes. And sometimes it's objects falling from the sky or from buildings usually, trees tumbling down, just missing the car. And every now and then it involves animals. I've seen some shark ones that just are enthralling or a kangaroo hopping across a mountain bike track and nearly, nearly hitting the rider. And my favorite one is this one. It involves a snowboarder videoing themselves going down the mountain. I think it's in Japan. And behind her, without her even realizing it, a bear is chasing her. Now, I'm not sure it's actually a real clip. I think there might be a little bit of editing involved, but it's the internet. Let's pretend it is true. And I love this clip because she has no idea of the peril that is actually behind her. She's just happily singling, singing along, and it's not until later when she watches it that she realizes there was a bear behind her this whole time. It's a near miss story. I love it. Well, today we finish the book of Esther. And we see how Esther has really been a near miss, close call story. And as we go through the passage today, we're not going to read all of the chapters, uh, but I'd love you to spend some time reading them on your own later on. Uh, but we see that there's three points we're going to look at in chapters 8 to 10. Firstly, there is unfinished business. Secondly, we see that there's a brutal reckoning. And finally, there's a lasting celebration. So let's jump straight in and there's unfinished business. Now, last week, we all sighed with relief. We cheered as God had achieved this huge reversal. Do you remember? Turn around, change directions, everything changed. Evil Haman, the one who hated the Jews and planned their murder, he ended up killed on his own big spike next to his home. And Mordecai the Jew was exalted. And we look at it, we think, brilliant. Case closed, job done. Not quite. There's a problem. There's unfinished business. And the problem is this. Haman, he'd made an edict or a law or a decree for the Jews to be killed. And in Persia, you couldn't just undo that. You couldn't just reverse it. Even the king himself was bound by these laws. You couldn't change your mind and just take it back. And so that's still a problem because this law said the Jews were going to be murdered. That's the problem. Esther and Mordecai step up and they find a solution. In verse 5, we read that Esther suggests a new law be made. If it pleases the king, verse 5 says, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he's pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. And what is this, this new law that is made? Well, the new law is given to us in verse 11. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of their enemies. Now the story begins to be tied up a bit more neatly. That unfinished business is being taken care of. And part of taking care of it, part of tying it up is that we see more of those reversals that we saw last week. Have a look at them. Firstly, the Jew hating Haman, who was the king's signet ring holder, the second in command, the powerful one. Well, that king's signet is taken off his dead body and it's given to Mordecai, and he becomes the one with all the power. There's a great reversal. In Esther, we see a reversal. Do you remember she was the weak, exploited one early in this book? And now we have her giving orders and having the king's favor. Then weak and exploited, now courageous and powerful. And look at the day that's chosen for this new law of the Jews defending themselves. It's, we're told in verse 12 that it's the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. That was the same day that the Jews were going to be wiped out. This reversal is complete. No longer are they going to be wiped out on this day. In fact, complete turnaround. They will be the ones doing the killing. 
their enemies will be attacked on that very day. And finally, the biggest reversal of all is in the last verse of this chapter, verse 17. Look how the chapter ends. In every province and in every city in which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Early on, Esther was told by Mordecai, don't let them know you're a Jew, hide your Jewishness. And then we see this complete reversal that now many nations, people from many nations are joining the Jews, becoming one of them. It's a complete reversal. And finally, we saw in those verses that there was weeping and wailing early on. Do you remember that when the the, the first edict was announced, when the Jews knew they were going to be killed, there was weeping and wailing? Well, what do we read about now? There is feasting, celebrating, joy and gladness. There's some complete reversals. And it'd be easy for us to only mention the feasting and the celebrating. It'd be easy for us to finish there. It's a nice ending. It's a happy ending. But there's an elephant in the room, so we need to talk about that. This is not a Disney ending. There's an awkward section here, and we see that in our next point. There's a brutal reckoning. Chapter 9 lays out the details of how the Jewish people killed their enemies. We're told in verse 6 that 500 men in the citadel in Susa were killed. Verse 9 tells us that Haman's 10 sons, his family, were, were killed by the Jews. Verse 13, Esther goes to the king and she says, can we just have one more day to do this killing? And he gives her another day and we read that another 300 men in Susa are killed. And verse 16 tells us the final tally, 75,000 people were killed. And we might find this section rather awkward. We don't like those Old Testament stories of of killing and bloodletting. And sometimes in our, our reluctance to engage with it, we miss one of the sad bits of it. We overlook probably the saddest bit from God's people's perspective. And that is that there was such hatred towards God and his people. 500 men and then another 300, 800 men right there in the citadel in Susa that were enemies of God's people and wanting to kill them. Haman's sons, yes, of course, they they took on their dad's values. But here we see not not just these 500 or 800 or 10 sons, but 75,000 people throughout the kingdom who hated God's people and wanted to kill them. That is very sad. And so this picture here is not of bloodthirsty vengeance. The picture here of this brutal reckoning is actually one of self-defense by the Jews. They only killed those who had planned and plotted and schemed and were going to kill them. And so this is self-defense. And in many ways, what we're seeing here is justice by God's hidden hand. He is delivering justice. Now have a look. Um, there's, there's that evidence for that. Back in, in chapter 8, verse 11, uh, we're told that, that the edict was attack your enemies and plunder their property. That's what the king said. You Jews, go and take everything for yourself. You can profit from this. But chapter 9 makes it really clear that the Jews didn't plunder anything. Verse 10 tells us they did not lay hands on the plunder. Verse 15 reminds us, they did not lay their hands on the plunder. And in case we missed it, verse 17 tells us they killed 75,000 of them, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The Jews were careful to make this not a self-serving, profiteering racket for them. Instead, they kept it as God's revenge, God's justice. This was about justice. But it does cause us to ask the question, Does this give Christians the green light to have a similar attitude? Does it invite us to wage some kind of holy war, to seek revenge on our enemies, to work at punishing or destroying those who hate God and hate God's people? Does this call on us to rise up and be a strong-armed kind of Christianity where we get those who are against us? Well, no, friends, it doesn't do that. In fact, I suggest to you it does the very opposite. See, this story here points us forward 
not to what we will do, but to God's judgment, God's brutal reckoning. He is the God of justice. When we try and exact revenge, we do it in a tainted way. We, we get all sorts of mixed motives and ignorance. We don't even know what's true and what people really are like. And we often become self-serving. But God's judgment is always right, is true, and is just. And so this story points us forward to the fact that God says vengeance is mine. We don't need to seek vengeance because this story points us to the fact God will judge. So this reckoning story, it's not a blueprint for us to replicate, thankfully. No, it's an invitation for us to trust God's judgment and to be comforted by that, that all evil will be dealt with. And so as awkward as you might find chapter 9 and this, all this bloodletting in this passage, it instead, rather than just wanting us to be awkward with it, it invites us to read it and be comforted and to look forward and to be glad. And that brings us to our, our final point, that gladness, because in this passage there is a lasting celebration. The Jews knew how to party. Again and again these three chapters speak of joy, of feasting, of celebrating, of gladness. And it's not just a one-off party either. It becomes this, this yearly, lasting celebration that turned into an annual holiday. Now, the second half of chapter 9, it spells out the, the how and the, and the why and the, the when this holiday was to take place. And in verse 26, we're told that this holiday will be called Purim from the word pur. Uh, why is it called that? Well, if we skip back in the story to chapter 3, verse 7, we read about when Haman was plotting to kill the Jews and he was obsessed with luck. And so he, he rolled the dice or, or cast the lot. And in chapter 3, verse 7, we're told that that word pur is the word for rolling the dice, for casting the lot. And we're told that when Haman did that to select the day for murdering the Jews, it rolled on the 12th month, the month of Ada. And so it bought the Jews all this time. It wasn't for a whole year that they were going to be murdered. Rolling the dice is what they named their holiday after. And it's because it landed on the 12th month and gave them time to be rescued, gave Mordecai and Esther time to, to intervene, to step in and save them. So were they just celebrating good luck with this festival? Well, no, they weren't celebrating good luck of the dice. They were celebrating God's hidden hand at work, even in the rolling of the dice, even in the timing of that, they recognized their whole festival was celebrating. God used that to save us. Not chance, but God saved us. Proverbs chapter 16, 16 verse 33 says this, the lot is cast, in other words, the dice is rolled, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Not good luck, but God's hidden hand. And so that's what they've celebrated in this festival. God saved us. Not mentioned in the book of Esther and yet clearly at work. And so what's the reason for such celebration though? You know, it's, it's not a, a one day party. This is a yearly event. Why is there such joy, such feasting? Why does it last so long? Why do they constantly remember these events? Well, it's because they get that they have avoided a great disaster. They look and understand and know we have been saved from something awful. They get it. Even the deaths in chapter 9 of their enemies is a stark reminder to us as we read of what would have, could have, or should have been. It should have been you, the Jews would have remembered. It should have been us. Now, in Ballina, that's a photo of our house a couple of years back, winter there, and we're building a snowman. You can see the grass is green because we've had to gather all the snow to make this tiny little snowman there. And Brooke and I and the kids, I think we're some of the rare people in Ireland who like the snow. We want it to snow. But the problem is every time we look at the weather charts and, it, and there's promise of snow coming, it seems to always avoid Ballina. We only get a tiny little bit of it, and I find that so frustrating. But I suspect people in Ballina never 
mark that day. You know, the day that they nearly got hit by a flurry of snow. I suspect there's no one in years to come who's going to look back at 2020's winter and say, do you remember that year? Do you remember that day that we nearly got snow and didn't? No one cares about that because it's no disaster that they've avoided. Well, this photo here is of a town called Malakuta here in Australia, and it's down on the Victoria New South Wales border. And this photo was taken in January this year when huge bushfires were bearing down on the town. There was over a thousand people sheltering down on the wharf and on the beach. They ended up having to evacuate them by sea. Uh, but as this fire came down, there were people praying, please, Lord, save us, turn the fire, change the, the winds. And that's exactly what happened. Rather than uh, coming right down to the beach, the winds changed and disaster was avoided. Now, people in Balaná might not remember the day it nearly snowed there, but I bet you that the people of Malakuda will always remember the day disaster nearly came. They will always remember their escape from disaster in the summer of 2020. And that's what's going on in this story. It is a near miss story in Esther. It's not just a, eh, they know to celebrate because they know the disaster that they missed. Now, if you have your Bible handy, I'd love you to turn to Luke chapter 15 because in this chapter, Jesus tells a few stories of, of uh, near misses, of lost things. And I think they're worth thinking about for a moment right now. So Luke 15. And we read Jesus talks about a lost sheep. Perhaps you're familiar with the story. He says this, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. There's celebration, great celebration, just over one sheep, over one person returning. And that's because there's an acknowledgement of what it is that would have happened. Otherwise, they were completely lost and now they're found. They were bound for hell and now they're saved. And so in this story, there is great celebration. Later in the chapter, there's the famous story of the prodigal son. Uh, you know, he, he'd, he'd acted in a wicked way. He, he'd sold his inheritance, asked for in his inheritance. He'd showed hatred towards his dad's own life. And he'd gone and he'd squandered it and wasted it with wicked living. And then in verse 17 of, chap of Luke 15, we read this. He came to his senses and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. The prodigal son knows the desperate situation he's in. He knows that he is, is ruined, that he's near starving, that he is hopeless and he knows that he's deserving of nothing good. And yet in that story, oh, what joy when the father runs to him and embraces him and forgives him. And we see in the story there is, there is much celebration, much celebration at this prodigal coming home. But his brother just doesn't get it, does he? Do you remember in the story his brother, he, his brother understands duty and merit and getting what you deserve. But his brother does not understand forgiveness and grace and salvation. I wonder, have you understood the desperate situation you're in? Do you see that in your sin, you're like the prodigal, you're, you're cut off, starving, ruined, hopeless, deserving nothing but God's anger, deserving nothing but hell? Friends, to grasp that truth of what it is we deserve and what we've been saved from, well, that is the only way to understand the gospel. It's the only way to understand what it is Jesus did on the cross. If we don't understand what we're saved from, how can we understand why it is Jesus came? It's the only way to understand grace, and it's the only way to have real joy. It's the only way to have 
a, a, an attitude of, of thankfulness to God. And it's the only way to join in this lasting celebration. Now, sometimes I, I hear exciting stories of how people became Christians, exciting testimonies. You know the ones about perhaps it's a gang member who, who, who encountered Jesus and his life changed completely or someone who was ruined by, by addiction and, and abuse and, and their, their life was a disaster and then they, they find Jesus and their life changes completely. Or those stories of someone who was a, a wicked, wicked criminal, a prisoner, and then they come to know Jesus and they repent and turn and change their ways. And I love those stories, but sometimes, to be honest, I compare them to my own story and it feels like mine is so boring. I was raised in a, a Christian home and at a young age, I, I believed in God and I wanted to follow Jesus from early on. And it can feel like my story is so boring compared to that. And that's a danger that many of you, I suspect, will face. The danger is this, that you forget to see what it is you have been saved from, that I forget to see what I've been saved from. And it can lead to pride and it can lead to looking down on others and it can lead to us losing sight of God's amazing grace. He has saved us, friends, from a disaster worse than death. And in doing so, we're a little bit like those YouTube clips, the near misses, the ones who have no idea what's behind them, have no idea what it is, this disaster that they've just avoided and so therefore have no joy or thankfulness in the moment. Don't be like that. See, knowing what you've been saved from, it brings great joy and it brings a change in us. It demands a, a thankfulness in us. It demands that we join in the party. Christian, we have a reason to celebrate, not just when things are going good, when things are all as they should be, but especially when things are hard. Because do you think the Jews, do you think they stopped celebrating this festival when they had hard years? Or do you think that was even more important, that they reminded themselves of what they'd been saved from and how God is gracious and merciful? Well, I can't help but wonder during this time of COVID-19 crisis. I can't help but wonder if God's hidden hand is at work in ways we can't even imagine. I mean, yes, last week we thought about some of those ways, but I, I wonder maybe God's doing more than just tweaking a few things in my daily schedule, in your daily schedule. Maybe God's doing a little bit more than that. Maybe God's at work to bring people from death to life. Maybe he's bringing those near miss kind of changes in people, bringing salvation. I've been hearing stories of of lots of people being open to God at the moment, uh, reading their Bible for the first time. We've had a message in Ballina of someone that would love to do that and wanted some advice on that, of people praying of people perhaps right now logging on to church services like this one and thinking about God and Jesus for the first time. Uh, my cousin who, who used to live and work in uh, Japan with her husband and kids uh, making Jesus known, uh, she told me just this week of a story of a friend of hers from Japan who she'd for years been trying to share the gospel with and only now has had this amazing openness and was able to lead her to put her trust in Christ. There's an openness now, friends. God is at work. Can you imagine a whole lot of future testimonies, stories of coming to faith that we're going to hear in years to come? And and I can imagine them saying, I became a Christian back in 2020 during that coronavirus crisis, during the pandemic. I can imagine that. Can you? And is it possible that these stories are more than stories you're going to hear about. Is it possible that these are stories God wants you involved in? Praying, earnestly praying, God, do something. Use this to take people from death to life. Seeking opportunities. God, how can I use this time to make your son Jesus known? He's good news known. 
acting in ways that show God's kindness to this hurting world, showing mercy and love and helping people who are struggling. Is it possible that this story could involve you? As we finish this series, we have seen that God's hidden hand is at work in miraculous ways, even during troubled times. He is the God who who brings great reversal, we've seen in Esther. He is the God who brings salvation. And perhaps he's given you and me unique opportunities to trust him and to serve him right now, to be salt and light right now. Perhaps you have come to this position for such a time as this.